Life is hard enough for kids living in foster care, and what some of them have faced under the care of the Massachusetts Department of Children and Families over the last several years has made a tough situation even tougher. Recent reports in the Boston Globe reveal an overwhelmed and understaffed system where, quote, social workers rely on archaic technology that is unable to track available emergency homes on any given night. Children are being bounced from home to home and enduring long waits for mental health care. And the state often fails to relay basic information that is already in a child's records. To make matters worse, the number of kids coming into the agency's care skyrocketed by nearly 20 percent in the last five years. At the same time, around 2,000 families have stopped taking in foster kids, compounding the pressure on an already strained system that consistently ranks among the worst in the country when it comes to finding stable placement for kids. This isn't the first period of trouble for DCF, something the governor has been quick to point out in response to past criticism. We put many new policies around investigative procedures. We never made any bones about the fact that when we took office, DCF had significant problems. Governor Baker, who pledged to reform DCF when he first took office, has made prior efforts to improve the agency, including a $150 million budget increase, the hiring of 300 additional caseworkers and nearly 100 managers. And now in response to the recent concerns, his administration is announcing a series of new reforms, including major technology updates, hiring more social workers again, and several new recruiters to bring on foster families. Secretary of Health and Human Services, whose department oversees DCF, Mary Lou Sutters, joins me. Good to see you, Secretary. Along with Peter McKinnon, Peter's the president of the local chapter of Service Employees International, the union which represents DCF social workers. Peter, it's good to see you, too. Secretary, are you confident that the reforms you announced will address, if not fix, the worst of what ails the foster care system? So I do believe that this set of reforms uh, continues to move the department in the right direction uh, in terms of increasing the number of foster homes, adding additional frontline workers, adding the technology, and providing the support so foster homes continue to stay in the system. Do you ever lie in bed at night and say, this is unfixable, I care deeply about this, but this is just too big, it's unfixable? No, because we can't say that about kids who come into the care and custody of the department. It's one of the most fundamental roles mm -hmm. of government. And social workers are our frontline emergency response workers, and we need to ensure that they have the tools. Do I lie awake at night all the time because I'm a worrier, as everybody knows? But this has to be intentional work. And DCF is always going to be a work in progress. You know, speaking of social workers, the head of the social workers union, you were quoted in the Globe as saying you have cautious optimism mm -hmm. about the reforms. What does that mean in English? Well, it, kind of exactly what it is. We're uh, optimistic that we're going to partner with the administration as we have in the past to address these these uh, problems in the system and reform the system to make it better for foster kids. Anything they didn't do that they should have, according to you? Uh, I would say the one thing, if I was going to. To, to answer that would be, uh, it, we, I wish we were here a little bit sooner, but we're here now to dig in on these reforms. Speaking of, I want to get to some of the problems and the reforms you're proposing in a minute. But in 2016, after another set of reforms by Governor Baker, you're quoted in the Globe as saying, I've been at DCF 18 years and morale is the lowest I've seen it in my career. Is it different now, three years later? It's better. There's progress that has been made. Caseloads for frontline workers are down. There's more to be done. Uh, the foster care system is the next step that we really need to start to address. Can I go down a list, if I may, Secretary, of some of the things that at least drove me nuts and had me thinking in bed? Social workers driving through the night, staying at a 24-hour McDonald's while supervisors with antiquated technology are trying to find a placement. Is that fixed? That will be fixed. Um, is it fixed today? No but the technology is being developed right now and we're overhauling that after hours system so by the fall yes that issue should be addressed you satisfied with that uh... it's a start and uh... it's in the right direction and and we'll see where we go but we're we're cautiously optimistic that we're heading that way one of the other stats uh, almost a third of foster kids are bumped from foster home to foster home uh, in the first few months, one of the highest rates in the country. Was that addressed in these joint reforms? Yeah, that's been a big part of it. The reason we're, we're looking to get more recruiters there, to get more staff to support the foster families so that we recruit and retain them. I want to talk about recruiting them in a minute and what your message is to them. Almost as many, as I said at the at top, Secretary, foster families who are, to me, should go directly to heaven. I, mean, um, it's I think we would all agree with uh, that. Uh, uh, almost as many dropped out of the system as are currently in the system. Do we know why this, this fallout happened? 
So I think there's a couple of things. I think one is because we have not had enough foster homes across the state that you weren't making perfect matches. So if you were a foster parent and said, God love you, you, you wanted to work with adolescents, and a, a child comes in who's an infant, you know, that's not, that's not a good match if the parent has to go to work in the morning. So what we need to have is the more foster homes than we could ever possibly need mm -hmm. so that you, we make perfect matches and that the match is stable for the child. When you mentioned that, you know, one of the other stats that stuck out for me, Peter, was that this 20% increase that I mentioned at the top, mm -hmm. in great part because of the opioid crisis, like almost everything is. Is a typical foster family prepared to deal with a kid who's taken away from a parent because of their an opioid problem? Yeah, I mean, that's part of the part of the problem and part of the thing that, that we hope to address in giving the foster families the support they need. These kids have been traumatized. They've been through things that we could never imagine. And if we don't give the foster families the tools that they need to deal with that trauma, it won't be successful. And, and finally, on my short list here is these mental health weights are just unconscionable. Uh, and by the way, it's horrible for teens and adults who are not in the DCF right. system. Is that six-month waiting period in some settings going to be lessened and lessened and lessened? So, so the access to behavioral health uh, transcends the Department yeah. of Children and Families, um, and we are starting actually a very intentional change around ambulatory behavioral health in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Starting June 5th, I'm actually engaged in a series of really intentional listening sessions and with a commitment that we're going to fix the front door and access for outpatient treatment for anyone, including kids in the Department of Children and Families. Because as Peter says, these are kids who experience whatever you think. Um, a child being removed from their biological family is in and of itself traumatic. And What's the so thinking on that in 2019? I mean, I know there have been debates about the philosophy, what I think the governor called it the mission. You know, is it keeping the family together? Is it w the welfare of the child? Where are we in 2019 as to what is number one? Is it it's the kid, right? I, to me, a fundamental responsibility is child protection. You can't strengthen families if you haven't also protected the child. So it's not an either or, it's mm -hmm. an and, but first and mm -hmm. foremost, it's about protecting the child. You know, my sense from afar, I, I do a radio show with Marjorie Egan, who's, you know, has written a lot through the yeah. years mm -hmm. and cares deeply about the foster care system too. Well, what I say to her often, and I've said on the radio, is it seems to me the biggest problem you face, and you probably can't admit this, so I don't know why I'm asking it, is there's no <laughs> constituency for this on Beacon Hill. Poor kids, kids who are at risk, it seems to me, I used to be a lobbyist up there, about here on the scale uh, uh, of things. That is, I mean, raise, that is part of the problem, is it not, Secretary? Um, I actually think that there is, I think children in foster care actually does have a constituency in the legislature and with Governor Baker. I mean, there's no question that the reforms of child welfare mm -hmm. is a pillar of Governor Baker's administration. And I think the leadership of the House and Senate, um, they may have a difference around whether we should terminate parental rights mm -hmm. faster or not, right? But mm -hmm. I would say foster kids. And I would say also as well, you know, one of the things that I'm proud of of our union is we're a union of social workers who do this. This is, a, yeah. we're taking this as an approach. This isn't about raises or wages or benefits for members. This is about doing what's right for kids and using the power of our membership yeah. to drive that. And as one well. of the most difficult jobs on the planet. Who is the typical foster family? I know it's really hard, but, but who isn't. are these people? Who are these people? They are, in, and there's actually been a couple of stories in the papers of foster parents. There's an unbelievable mm -hmm. one this weekend of someone who had a child from birth, yeah. right, and got them ready to go to a new family. These are individuals who literally open their hearts and their homes to children in need, and they do it for that reason. It's an, it's an altruism that, as you say, you know, straight path to heaven. Um, and and they're, they're op other than long, I don't know if this is terminology people like you use, mm -hmm. the longer term mm -hmm. care for a child, mm -hmm. sure. their emergency, pl I mean, Rachel Rollins was sitting here shortly after mm -hmm. she was elected. Yeah. The Suffolk County DA, I didn't know this, 50 kids she's taken on in an emergency mm -hmm. base over three years and continues to do it yeah, as mm -hmm. the as district this, attorney uh, of Suffolk County. It's unbelievable. Yeah. There are short term things like that. And yeah. I know years ago there used to be a thing where even if you can't commit to that, can you still take a kid out for 
a few hours or lunch or th is that permissible or is that non-existent? I think that's one of the things that we're going to look at, and and it, the foster care system does span, uh, the, you know, that whole uh, gambit, and we need all of all of those families to help out. And one of the conversations that we started to have is, is respite care, and that's what that uh -huh. is: people who can take a kid for a little bit to respite give that care. family a break. Oh, for the parent, is for the foster parent, right. as the foster much parent. as it is for, for the, the kids. Kid. So that's yeah, something sure. in the works. Yep. What's the biggest, most intractable thing that does keep you up at night that you haven't been able yet to fix, Secretary? That we actually have to remove children from their biological families and potentially um, go through the courts, which takes a fairly long mm -hmm. time to actually have them adopted into a new family because we need to be thinking in kid time and not adult mm -hmm. time. If someone wants to become, or at least get information about being a foster family, what do they do? Oh, there's a 1-800 number for DCF, and we will get that number to you, and just literally call DCF, and we'd, we would love to have uh, so many more foster families. The other thing I'd say to you, though, Jim, is I think one of the reasons the constituency for child welfare has improved in Massachusetts and in the State House is because, well, we may have our differences um, on occasion, our different perspectives, right, on management, he's union, is that we, we agree so much more than we disagree, mm -hmm. and that is different than I think in the past. By the way, you, as a former union president, you preempted my final <laughs> comment <laughs> that I was going to make, so congratulations <laughs> on that relationship and good work. Oh. Peter, it's good to see you. Thank you. Secretary, thank you for Always. your time. Good nice luck with everything. Really appreciate it.